and IMT in collaboration with the US Department of Energy, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the European Commission. Today, we've got speakers from the European Commission, Johnson Controls, the US Department of Energy, and Vat Kotelet. I am Lati Schlegel, Executive Director at the Institute for Market Transformation, and I will be your host and moderator today. So, um, I believe we have a quick question for you all to, to start off. So um, we have a polling question for you all um, asking you which sector best represents your work today? Are you representing an NGO, government, private sector, industry, or other, which you can please uh, share in the chat box. All right, thank you all for answering uh, the, the polling questions. Um, I'll get started with a few uh, housekeeping items um, so that you know how to participate in today's event. This is a screenshot of what you are seeing on your screen. Um, to the left is the WebEx viewer through which you see the presentation, and to the right is the WebEx control panel where you can use the chat box and ask questions of our panelists today. Um, we've taken a, a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface, so you should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Um, you're listening and using your computer speaker system by default. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions. Just type your questions into the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. And you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of each agenda item. Throughout the webinar, you'll be able to answer polling questions as you just did that will be displayed on the right side of your screen. We will also send the slides and the recording directly to your inbox on Monday. Um, for those of you who specifically requested uh, a participants list, will uh, you will receive uh, that. Not, note that only of those of you who have already requested a participants list will be will be named. Um, we are sharing name, title, and organization only.
All right. So let's get started uh, today with our first panelists. Um, we have uh, four panelists uh, joining us today. Uh, and we uh, our, our first session is going to be uh, the network of energy efficiency jobs. Uh, our two speakers joining us today are uh, Gunda Ogar and John Steele. Um, I will first pass the, the microphone over to uh, Gunda Ogar, who's the Secretary General of Bat Cartelet. And Gunda, do I understand you're the proud father of a soccer star? Yes. All right. Well, maybe you can uh, share a little bit about that and take us away today. <clears throat> yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. If uh, Lorde, if uh, if you uh, if you allowed me to to talk about soccer, uh, ten minutes uh, is not enough. I'm afraid. I'm uh, very well renowned as one of the world's best Monday trainers. So I'm uh, <laughs> yes. My son plays in Holland. If if some uh, <clears throat> have if some have seen the familiar name, but. Uh, <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm the general secretary of the Danish building trades. I'm looking after construction workers of all kinds. I'm also in the leadership of the European Federation of Building and Woodworkers and is, uh, have a place in the, in the high level forum for construction under the EU Commission and have been around for quite a long time. So <clears throat> I've been engaged in these questions for, for very long. And if you look into how we can create jobs from <clears throat> energy efficiency uh, measures, energy renovating the existing building stock, it's a tremendous chance to create jobs. And on a European basis, if we start with the EU, <clears throat> we have the building directive, we have the energy efficiency directive, we have the renovation wave, we have fit for 55, we have <clears throat> we have a lot of money being transferred from EU to national governments in order to achieve some of these objectives regarding sustainable construction, energy efficiency, and energy renovating the existing building stock. And I think that the EU have actually been doing a lot and now two of the directives, the building directive and energy efficiency directive is being revised. <clears throat> and one of the things there is that 3% of the existing public building stock should be energy renovated every year. One of the targets in the renovation wave is to energy renovate 30 million buildings in the EU before 2030. That gives a tremendous amount of jobs of all kinds in our industry, both those who are active on the building sites, but also in the building material industry with architects, engineers, and what have we. So I think the future in many ways, job-wise, looks, uh, <clears throat> looks rather bright and, and we can be optimistic. The only problem basically is that many of the EU initiatives, or maybe all of them, actually needs national action plans. We need the nation states, the national governments, the national structures, the national stakeholders to get involved and make sure that this is actually happening. Because it probably won't happen by itself. And there are also some countries that may be are a little hesitant of engaging too much in this. Some countries are running huge public deficits and maybe they're not so keen on using public money on energy renovating if they have to take them from welfare, hospitals, pension schemes, and what have we. So therefore, I think a big task in the future if we are to look into this bright, prosperous job future of ours, I think that both for the European Commission, but also for the European Parliament, it's quite <clears throat> important 
that they actually overlook that things are happening according to plan, so to speak. Many countries in, in Europe are really well on the way. My own, for example, there's many jobs in energy renovating the existing building stock. Uh, we talk a lot about <clears throat> recycling, reusing uh, building materials. Uh, we talk about sustainable construction. We talk about quality, just the physical, the physical quality. How how long can a house, a building last? We talk about <clears throat> the functional quality of a building. <clears throat> Maybe it was built as a bank. Maybe when it's not going to be used as a bank anymore, it can be used as a hotel or maybe student <clears throat> student accommodation or whatever. So I think that <clears throat> many countries are actually doing a lot, but we need to get all of Europe with us. We can spend a lot of time talking about what governments should do, but there are other actors and they may be just as important to our industry and to job creation as governments are. I'm not trying to say governments are not important. I'm just trying to say they're not the only player on the field because <clears throat> one of the very big clients to our industry is actually municipalities. Municipalities who are very close to <clears throat> the people who live in the cities, who live in the regions who live in the municipalities. A lot of cities are now drawing up their green transition plans, their climate plans, also covering the construction industry. One example of this in big cities is the C40 Corporation on Clean Construction. A thousand cities approximately that are not members of the C40 have actually adopted the policy of clean construction as a means of trying to be more sustainable and adapt to climate change. I think that organizations, trade unions like myself, employer organizations, NGOs, everyone who wants to get involved don't only use your time with governments. Go and find a friendly mayor. It's often much more easy to get something done concretely in our industry when you want to energy renovate, build sustainably, and create jobs and activity for the, competent, for the companies. I also think one of the ways to create jobs and activity and get things done is that a lot of building owners Actually, most building owners are amateurs. They don't really know what it is that they own. They, they know they own a house or an office building, but they are actually amateurs. <clears throat> so in order to do the right thing, it would be a very good idea if we can have sound, unbiased advice to building owners of what should be done, what is the most important thing and what is um, and what is second, what is third, what does it approximately cost, and what kind of benefits does it give you? Not only saving energy, but also giving a better interior climate, better lighting, a better environment for people to be in, to live in, to work in, to learn in, to do whatever in. It's also something that comes with a price, comes with a cost, has a benefit, in this, and I think we should be better actually to tell about this and detect it. <clears throat> but I think it also all starts that you have a sound, unbiased advice on what is best for your building, for your environment. <clears throat> also in the <clears throat> social housing sector, there's room for much improvement. Some social housing, agencies around Europe are actually in the forefront of uh, energy renovating and renovating uh, generally and have big programs from that. Actually something of scale that other countries could relate to so it will be easier, quicker and cheaper to do energy renovating. 
They are also a big client to our industry in many countries. Other institutional investors <clears throat> in our industry, pension funds, for example, could also be persuaded to energy renovate their building stock using the same arguments that it actually gives a better experience for people. Because what is the whole purpose of using energy? Well, it's to get warm or to get a bit cooler. And where I'm sitting now, it's already dark. So also to get light. And <clears throat> if we don't take that into consideration, we may be missed the target and maybe not get the full amount of benefits that we could have. I uh, will try to wrap up now and say that in terms of what we have to build, what we have to renovate, there's a lot of jobs, but there's a third component, and that is when the house is finished, the whole management of the house, the facilities management, the more and more complex installations, securing clean air, regulating heat, damp, light, whatever, that we always try to get the maximum effect of these installation and the whole facilities management of our existing building stock is actually also a tremendous source for saving energy, but it's also a tremendous new source for creating more and also very exciting jobs because you are actually here trying to save the planet. And digitalization, of course, plays a large part in, in this. So I think I will, <clears throat> I will stop here and I will gladly answer questions in the chat to the best of my ability. And thank you for inviting me. And then we'll talk soccer another day. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gunda. If you have questions for uh, Gunda, please go ahead and um, drop them in the chat uh, now. Um, and in the interim, I'm going to also ask you a, a, a question. We will have a polling question for our audience today. Um, in your opinion, what is needed to accelerate job creation in energy efficiency? Is it more training opportunities from the government, more training opportunities within the private sector, a focus on education and upskilling, uh, better accounting of what qualifies as an energy efficient job so it is clearer how many jobs there are in the field, or something else? Please write those in the chat as well. All right, it looks like there is a question for you, uh, sir, on um, your on your on your previous point on working with cities and mayors. We have the global covenant of mayors for climate and energy here in the US. Any, any NGOs uh, wishing to work with us, please contact us. Um, I was going to ask you, are there what are the most effective uh, ways you see uh, people getting into the field uh, in the EU? The most effective way, I, I, I think that the, one of the most effective ways is actually to, to make your presence known towards uh, mayors and, and, and local councils. Uh, they, they may not know you are there, they may not know what you have on offer. And, and I think that, that the mayors and local councils everywhere are actually also trying to create the necessary networks in, in order to achieve their green objectives on, on a broad basis. And their construction plays a major role because like a lot of the infrastructure is, is, is driven and, and owned by municip municipalities. They own a lot of buildings. And I think that they, they, they are also looking for like stakeholders who wants to take responsibility and who want to like, learn as we go, so to speak, because uh, we do have a lot of knowledge, so we don't have to wait for new knowledge, but also create knowledge along the way, so to speak. And, and there, I think that everyone with good ideas and good intentions uh, should, should engage. And there's a lot of, of, of C40 is only one organization. Uh, it's actually at the moment led by Eric Gassetti from, uh, from Los Angeles. 
so so uh, and and our North American friends may know him. <laughs> I would suppose they do. And 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 so so there's a lot of American initiatives also, many of them centered uh, around municipalities and cities who wants to make a difference. Wonderful. There's another question uh, here. Has the EU has had the experience of renovating public buildings already under the existing legislation? Can you speak to uh, about that experience and any successes about this approach? Um, I can, and and I think that when we, <clears throat> I don't know. I pay tax to the municipality, to the state, and to the local government. I, I don't I don't really care what kind of public building I'm paying to. What puzzles me and and many others is that uh, why is it only state-owned buildings that is under the building directive? Uh, it should be all public buildings. It should be all buildings owned by public companies. And uh, during this revision uh, of the directives, we will definitely work hard with a lot of engaged organizations and people to 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 get that point across. Uh, it's it's not it's not necessarily very easy, uh, but but we will still try to do it. And so that would be like the three percent that has to be in your, on on a on an average basis, be energy renovated every year. Schools, kindergartens, nursing homes, what have you. The opportunity is enormous, as you say. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. At this point, we, will, we can move on to our next presenter and uh, perhaps the questions that we did not uh, get to, we can come back to after, after John speaks. Um, so here, uh, with us from Johnson Controls is John Steele, who is the uh, Senior Director of Government Relations, um, and he is going to speak with us today um, on his perspective on uh, career pathways. John, Good. over to you. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? I can. I can hear you loud and clear. Terrific. Uh, unfortunately, my camera is blocked for some reason, but uh, you see my you see my face there, so that's sufficient. And will the slides be progressed, please? Beautiful. Thank you. And hello, all. John Steele with Johnson Controls. I do apologize for the delay. Technical difficulties on this end, but uh, thank you, Jessica and others for your patience and help to eventually get me in here. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, the purpose of my uh, role here on the panel is to discuss how Johnson Controls is filling its job pipeline when it comes to HVAC and not only that, but also uh, life safety and security. Uh, so what you're going to hear from me over the next few minutes, over the next probably seven slides, is how we have had to transition, how we've had to change how we fill these jobs, where previously, in previous years and decades, by and large, the job seekers will come to us. Now it's a shift, there's gotta be a balance. And so the next slide, please. Thank you. What we call this is our green HVAC CR career pathways. And there are four elements, uh, five elements actually, that I'm going to be talking about briefly through this presentation. One is you see at the, uh, in this slide, we reach out to departments of corrections, which I'll detail in a moment. We also, for example, in the city of Philadelphia, have a high school lab, which I'll detail in a moment. We're working with community colleges. We're working with trade schools and um, also veterans as they're rolling out of the military to have them uh, be part of the Johnson Controls family. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we have here is again, the, the challenges. This speaks to what we do in the Department of Corrections. And you know, at the end of this presentation, there'll be some pictures that'll show what we do in real time in prisons in the United States. How this is made possible is that we will work with a given state's Department of Corrections to overhaul their woefully antiquated HVAC system. We're talking about systems that are decades old, that by and large have not had the maintenance that they've needed, and the time has come for overhauling those systems. 
what we offer to these departments of corrections, for example, we're uh, well underway many years under our belt in Louisiana, as well as the state of Virginia, is hire us to do the program and the overhaul and the savings are so extraordinary consistently that those dollars that are saved, the prison can then spend to set up a laboratory, a uh, classroom of sorts in the prison that we will then run with them and it'll be populated by all of the state of the art HVAC equipment that we have. And then the warden of that prison will select X number of prisoners who are by and large two or three years out from being released who have shown interest in not coming back to jail. Obviously, they want to have a career. They want to have a job and those prisoners will be selected for this program. And it's a two two, three year program, depending on how often the classes are held weekly. But by the time they're done, they are fully certified. HVAC technicians, the best of the best, because we bring our curriculum in and we bring our equipment in and we bring our own faculty in, which I'll uh, have a picture of down the road. So this is one way that we've been able to start to fill that emptying pipeline because so many of our technicians, as well as technicians, HVAC technicians across the country are retiring at a fast, fast rate. So we're going again, the aforementioned different avenues that we're taking, uh, we're going that way to fill that pipeline. So this speaks again to the partnership that we have with the departments of correction in Virginia, Louisiana, and in other states. Uh, next slide, please. Now, potential career paths, working with Johnson Controls through the, again, the corrections, the high school labs, community colleges, trade schools, and also with uh, exiting veterans, there are these four career paths that they can take. They can do building maintenance specialist, they can do green HVAC and uh, technician mechanic, they can be a facility maintenance electrician, as well as a building automation systems technician. Now you'll notice in the uh, third picture left to right, that is a woman doing that work. One of the things that we have been uh, putting a particular focus on is introducing working with Johnson Controls in this HVAC trade as a great career for women. We have a number of women across the country who are in leadership in these positions and they've started in the field working on buildings and then it worked their way up to management. So. The bottom line here, as we present these to all sorts of different people that we want to recruit to come to Johnson Controls, we introduce this as a career, not a job. This is a career. And so these are different career paths that they can take, but it's uh, been enormously successful. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then this is our Institute, which we've had for decades. And this briefly is just the different ways that students in the uh, program uh, get uh, the education that they need to be able to be successful in this. So you'll see that we run from one to seven. I won't read each of these out. You can see them for yourselves and also in the event that the, this deck is available to you after, you can certainly uh, see this on your own. But it's a partnership. This is all about a partnership. Again, going to where those potential employees are, we have to have uh, that outreach to them. And this speaks to all the variety of things that can be done working with Johnson Controls for an HVAC career in the green economy. And that's what we underscore is because we are an innovator, because we're on the cutting edge, you, a potential employee, have an opportunity to be part of a company and to have a career run that makes a difference when it comes to the green economy. Uh, next slide, please. And this just going back to our um, Department of Corrections program, uh, excuse me, will you go back one, one slide, please? To that blue, thank you. Uh, short and sweet here, but here in the United States, always of concern for the um, Departments of Correction and society at large are the uh, recidivism. And um, again, if it's possible to go back to the blue slide, if you could go back uh, one more, thank you. This just speaks to the, the success of our program of the Departments of Correction that when a prisoner is released, there are two foundational things they need not to go back into jail. Uh, we have, thank you for going back to that slide. If there's a way to hold that, I would appreciate it. Uh, one is stable housing. The other is stable employment. So our, our program works in terms of reducing recidivism. Thank you, I'll, 
I'll take that however um, I can here. Uh, but that speaks to the low, extraordinary low percentage of recidivism of uh, um, employ excuse me, graduates who leave our program. And then if you could just for the last uh, three slides quickly. Uh, thank you. We'll finish. There we are. This is a Johnson Controls employee or the previous slide. That's Jerry Hirsch who works for us. He is in the prison in Louisiana, Angola prison, and he's training those prisoners to become HVAC technicians. What's interesting about this picture, there's not a guard in that room. That's Jerry by himself with those prisoners. That speaks to the commitment that these prisoners have to learn to become HVAC techni technicians to then have a career upon graduation. And for many of them, the starting salary out of being out of being released from prison with these uh, credentials, fifty thousand dollars a year. And so that's Louisiana. The next slide, please. The uh, that's the program in Virginia. So these are students prisoners using the latest curriculum. Much of this is from Johnson Controls, but it is the latest curriculum and textbooks out there, and they get hands-on experience to uh, run this, uh, learn from this program. So you can go to the last slide, happy to answer any questions from anyone now or when we do that at the end. But I do thank you for the opportunity to speak and I'm available after this presentation to take any calls or emails from anyone if you'd like to learn more about Johnson Control's approach on this front. So thank you. Thank you, John, so much for that presentation. Um, one question for you just to, to kick us off here is um, I really appreciated your framing around uh, careers and career pathways in this space. Um, and do, do you see that the participants in the in the programs that you've just spoken about often stay at Johnson Controls for a long time? Um, or how what, what does that look like? Yes. It has longevity to it because there's an opportunity to uh, ascend in terms of management, et cetera, and also just the, the benefits of working for Johnson Controls in terms of the salary and the and the benefits. But it is a job that has great stability because again, we the company puts so much on innovation and we're in an enormously competitive industry. And you know, our hats are off to Honeywell and Siemens and Schneider, et cetera. Uh, so we all keep each other aggressive. And so the innovation is critical to Johnson Controls. And with that comes out your stability, which of course the employees benefit from as well. And Paul asked a great question uh, that I think would love to hear from John Orgunda. Um, how do we get society to value trades more? This work is so important. Um, what, what do you think needs to happen to, to get society to value trades more? If I may, I'll just give one comment and turn it over to my colleague here on the panel. We take a local approach, absolute local approach. So we go into those communities, we go into high schools and where we can get a contract to do an overhaul of that system. We bring the, the students in who show interest in learning how to do HVAC work. Because one of the things that we need to collectively we shake is, and I'm gonna use an analogy for manufacturing in which Johnson Controls has a lot in the United States, is the three D's, dark, dirty, and dangerous. Okay, that's not the case in today's manufacturing in the United States, at least with Johnson Controls. And that's not the case with these jobs. These are not uh, dirty, so to speak, jobs. They're very much driven by um, having a, a, a device in your hand, computer driven, et cetera. So it's a way to have them understand that, uh, yes, this you can know technology, you can use it here in your job. Uh, so that we see this in a way, for, particularly for women, as an extension of STEM, and getting into careers that way, but we very much take a local approach because we want to establish these relationships with these feeder institutions that over the out years will continue to bring us candidates mm -hmm. to hire for the long haul. Do you have a response on that one? Yes, it's it's like a recurring <clears throat> theme about how we attract young people to, to our industry. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, I think that we should try to tell about that even if you enter construction, you become a bricklayer, a plumber, a carpenter, painter, electrician. You're not stuck there. You're actually very popular for many other industries to employ. Uh, so, And we are very mobile and we can work all over the world. And we are now also entering a phase of digitalization in construction. It's about documentation, 
uh, of LCI, LCA, life cycle analysis and building materials, documenting the interior uh, environment, the air quality and everything. And I think for our members, it's important to know <clears throat> that the construction worker job can actually be upscaled. And, and when people say to me, are we going to have robots in construction? I said, there are already places where you have robots. What is important for me is that it's our members who program them. So, and I think we have to tell these stories and we also have to tell a story to the, to the young women who are finding out what they want to, to spend their life on. Because we are not, <clears throat> historically, we haven't been very good to attract women into our trades. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Maybe the way we talk about our industry is not very, doesn't sound very promising for many women. Uh, so I, I think that's like half of the population that we, we, we have excluded ourselves from. And, and I think we have to be much, much better at trying to include the young women in our trade and, and, and open their eyes for what are the opportunities. You don't have to be a bricklayer all your life, even if you have a four year vocational training as bricklayer, as we do in our country. You can actually do a whole lot of other things if that's what you want. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing those perspectives. These are such exciting careers. Uh, one of the things we often say uh, in my organization is you're not only are they good jobs, but they're also um, you, you're doing something great for the planet in, in energy efficiency and, and renovation work as well. Um, so from a company point of view or industry point of view, what policy recommendations do you think would help your work in energy efficiency and jobs? Open questions of the panelists. Yes, open Please questions to either ahead. one of you. Yes, thank you. Please, John, if you want to go ahead. Uh, it's again embrace of the innovation uh, and uh, knowing that this pays dividends in so many ways. Again, as as I described, in terms of a career that works for so many people and. Um, Many different ways. I mean, the, the, I handle state government relations for Johnson Controls. I have 50 state responsibility. And the way that I approach this is that there are reasons for Republicans to like what we do, and there are reasons for Democrats to like what we do. Now, the reasons may be different, but at the end of the day, it's still a collective benefit. And so that's one of the ways that I approach this in terms of a green and uh, a green industry and, and what it means because it's it's cost savings for one and it benefits the environment for the other, whatever the case may be, but it's um, embracing it for what it actually is and what it means to the economy and to the environment. <clears throat> Just to follow up on this, that a lot of the questions we are, <clears throat> we are talking about, many of the challenges have, have to do with construction because it's about the built environment. And, and, and therefore, we, we, we are at, at the center point here. And, and a lot of companies have actually realized that and, and are also in the driving seat of, of this green transition and energy renovating and, and, and building sustainably. And, and I think that force will only increase in the future because due to estimates from the UN in, 20, in 2050, we will be 3 billion people more on this planet. And, and I, hope, I hope they get roof over their heads. And I know that in many places, most of the buildings that stands in 2050 have already been built in Western Europe, North America, it's approximately 70%. But in Africa, Asia, Latin America, it's around 50%. So we'll have to build more, not only buildings, but the infrastructure and how we make cities for people, how we make them sustainable, how we make them livable, how we make them secure, how we make these cities function. I would say that that is a tremendous task for a company to be part of a solution and also for people working in those companies and with these 
really, really big, but really, really important questions. So I actually think that our industry have a very bright future. Sometimes politicians doesn't really uh, see this because they would actually rather use the money for, for something else. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, I think they will realize that, that this is important and our industry is really important and is one of the key, has some of the key solutions or will bring forward some of the key solutions for many of the problems that we are facing. Yeah, thank you for that. Another follow-up question for you, Gunda. What are, are the actors who have renovation knowledge in France? And I think picking up on, on your point of so many buildings are already in existence and so many structures are very old. Um, are the renovations, uh, I think the question is, the are agency doing, doing energy modeling and are there advisory services to make sure that the renovations are comprehensive in those buildings? <clears throat> the short quest, the quick answer is no, not enough. I think in some countries it, it's better than others and, and some municipalities and governments and state agencies are working maybe in a more structured way. And therefore, I think it's, it's really important that when we are now to spend a lot of money, a lot of effort on energy renovating, that we try to learn from each other. Where are the good cases? What are the good models? I said before, some social housing agencies have really big, comprehensive <clears throat> renovation, also energy renovation <clears throat> experiences that others can learn from. And they are actually one of the focal points for the EU Commission. We're talking about energy poverty and what have we. But, but, but I think there are many, many more building owners who could actually come into play here and say, what have we done? What worked? What wasn't so good? And, and the, the thing here is, of course, that we need data and we need that data to be open source. So we can actually try to extract what works, what is a good way forward. And, and, and we know a lot already. I think we, we, what, we, what we basically need is, is to get all our knowledge and all, all what we actually can do now, get it working. And then, of course, gain new knowledge as we go along. Did that make any kind of sense? <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, one final question for um, this one, I believe for John, uh, about uh, what is the driver in the US for your innovative approach to uh, bringing in new uh, workers and new careers? Um, and as a follow up to that, do you apply it just in the US or elsewhere too? Would you, uh, Lodi, would you repeat the first question? I unfortunately had a little dropout on my end. Sure. Uh, what is the driver in the U.S. for your innovative approach to uh, to uh, recruitment and training? Okay, sure. <laughs> so here's the bottom line: as I as I said, we're a great innovator, but if we don't have employees to install, maintain, update what we innovate, then we're not going to last very long. <laughs> so uh, it's critical that we have a talented workforce in the 50 states to be able to take all this extraordinary innovation that we have and put it in these buildings to make them more efficient, to make them more sustainable, to build that kind of partnership. So it is a codependency in a way that the innovators need the uh, installers and the installers need the innovators to keep innovating. And so that is the, the bottom line motivator as we need those folks out there at the street level doing all that great install work and also coming back with ideas as to how things could be done better. It's a two way street for us. We very much want to hear the feedback from our employees as to possibly a better way to do this, a better way to do that. And forgive me the second question, please. Yeah, the second question is, do you uh, apply the same training uh, that you're doing in US states in other parts of the world? Not to that degree, and in fact, coincidentally, got a question about that uh, this morning. Uh, but we do look to build it out, uh, but not to the level of maturity and robustness that we have it right now in the United States. But uh, there's always tomorrow. 
Well, I wanted to thank you both for sharing your uh, thoughts with us and to all of our participants. Thanks for the great questions and uh, great engagement in the chat. Um, with that, we're going to move on to our next set of speakers. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Roman Horvath, the policy officer for uh, construction. Uh, or, or sorry, uh, it looks like maybe we're going to Maddie first. Is that is that right, Margo? Okay, let's go to to Maddie first. So I'd like to introduce Maddie, who is the workforce advisor for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy of Energy. Um, and Roman Horvath, who's a policy officer for sustainable industrial policy and construction with DG Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs with the Euro European Commission. These are our, our next two panelists. And we will start first with Roman. Thank you, and please take it away. Thank you very much for introducing me. And I would like also to thank you, my two predecessors, to Gunda and John Per for very good presentation, uh, very good replies to the question which were posed. So please let's go straight away to my presentation, please in the first slide. Uh, yes, in the commission, we are in charge of policies. So regarding construction, I would like to say that it's one of the biggest part of EU economy. So it's very important for the growth of the economy and very important for creation of jobs, especially, let's say, local jobs. And as Agunda said, it's also some kind of enable or key player solution provider. Yes, but the construction sector and buildings or built environment which is being built, it also consumes a lot of raw materials. It produces a lot of emissions and construction and demolition waste. It's rather important because the European Union has some global climate goals, as already mentioned by Gunde, I must say, that there is 55% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and there is aim of the European Union to be climate neutral by 2050. For the moment, we have already legislation in the European Union that all new buildings should be nearly zero energy buildings. And as was already mentioned, we have the so-called so renovation wave initiatives, which aims to double annual energy renovation rates of existing buildings in the next two years. So we might say that we have also already done, there are some stimulus. We need to have new buildings which are zero energy consumption. We would like to renovate more and more so definitely mastering new energy efficiency for construction workers and working with adequate materials and technologies is some kind of new normal. Because they, when they would like to work with buildings, definitely they will need some kind of knowledge about energy efficiency. They wouldn't be able to escape it. So therefore I just use this term new normal for workers. And of course, the construction industry, as was already mentioned in Europe, it's uh, facing some lack of workers, skills gaps, and mismatches. Please, next slide. Regarding European Commission, uh, there is some kind of division of powers and responsibilities between Commission and Member States. So therefore, there is some kind of cooperation in this area regarding construction and training and let's say various programs, how to stimulate uh, energy efficiency in construction sector. Our president, Madame uh, von der Leyen, at the beginning of her term, stressed that uh, really investment in people, skills and training and education is very important because uh, our human capital is very limited, uh, we cannot really waste it, so we need to get out of it the most is possible. So therefore, we focus very much on skills and education. Uh, regarding the Commission role in this aspect, the Commission is provided targeted funding 
and supporting EU creation of EU-wide partnership at the good practice sharing. Because member states are having different approaches, different, let's say, history, so different uh, skills, different way how they are dealing with things. So our role in the Commission is also to pick good practices and to share them. So it's not necessary to invent again the wheel, just pick it here and there and share with other member states. And as was already discussed with my other predecessors, we are very much focusing on vocational education and training, let's say work-based learning, which facilitates a smooth school to work transition and increased availability of skilled workforce. Next slide, please. When I'm speaking about funding, uh, at the moment we are launching two big financial programs at the European Union. First one is Recovery and Resilience Facility. This is some kind of reaction and stimulus program after still running COVID-19 pandemic. So to stimulate uh, national economies to grow. And uh, as you can see, uh, as was mentioned by Gunde, that every country needs to prepare its own program to address its own challenges, because those challenges might be different in every country. But the Commission is providing some kind of guidelines, what should be addressed. Of course, various specificities, cities and member states should be addressed in their own way. And those, uh, let's say, national plans of, uh, which are funded by recovery and resilience facility should focus on green and digital skills regarding upskilling and reskilling. And upskilling and reskilling is one of the seven priorities of this funding facility. There is already a link where you would like to read more about that. There is all information available. Then at the moment we are launching cohesion policy for 21-27, so cohesion funds which also will support all either construction activities as such, but also training and skills development. There is a lot of money available. Of course, uh, as I said, in this area, there is a shared management. So therefore it's uh, uh, member states who are exactly saying what kind of skills should we develop? Where are skills, gaps and mismatches or shortages? So there is, a, uh, let's say, some kind of shared management within the Commission and Member States. Next slide, please. Of course, we are running also some kind of project at uh, Commission level, trying to support Member States. Next slide. I would like to mention two principal projects. Uh, uh, First one is so-called blueprint for sectoral cooperation and skills in construction. This is a four year long project, which is like by stakeholders, a consortium of 24 stakeholders from construction sector. And it's a partnership. I mentioned already before, the commission is contributing to partnerships. This is a partnership of web provider, so skill uh, training, and education providers and construction companies because education providers are providing skills to workers and those companies are needed workers so they should find some common way common speech what kind of skills are needed and those skills should be provided to construction workers so the aim of this project is to analyze what kind of skills are needed in short and long term in construction industry, whether those skills and training modules are available. And if not, the consortium should develop necessary training modules to address those skills gaps. As you see, the project will end next year. So there is still some time to get final results, but there is a website in which you can consult intermediary results. And those skills should primarily focus on digitalization, energy efficiency, and circularity. There is also some brother, little brother of this big blueprint, smaller blueprint, which focuses on health and safety. 
because especially like for energy efficiency, there are various new materials, new technologies. So we would like to be cautious and let's say to prepare workers also in the area of health and safety. And let's say uh, COVID-19 pandemics remind us that there are always some concerns about health and safety issues. So there are eight modules, training modules, four are focusing on materials like insulation materials, finishing materials, bituminous materials, sustainable materials. Three are focusing on operation, isolation operations, inverted green roofs, and renewable energy systems. And the last one is on waste management. Uh, there is a platform on which you have those eight interactive modules. Also, you can download it as a PDF, let's say documents, to be, let's say, read at computer or printed later. And there are, most of them are in English, in English and Spanish, but some of them are also in French, Italian, German, and Polish languages. So please consult them and you will see what the commission, or let's say the, our contractor of the blueprint has developed for the commission. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the screenshot of the website of the blueprint. When you can see that the blueprint project also collects good practices and innovative uh, initiatives across the, those 12 countries involved in this project. Because as I said, it's always easy to take uh, in some inspiration of something what is functioning well and it's not necessary to invent it again. So there is interactive map with various projects or let's say skills developments, and you can call that also for your inspiration, this map. Next slide, please. Also during the last decade, the commission supported at European level, various projects focusing on skills development in construction sector. Uh, those are European wide projects. So usual consortia, which are running such a projects are from several European countries. They are focusing on various aspects of skills. So they are funded also from various sources. I'd say a lot of them were fo focused on energy efficiency and you can find a lot of information about those projects focusing on energy efficiency on build up portal. There's a link to the build up portal so you can consult the portal and projects mentioned there as well. Next slide, please. And now I would like to speak more about partnership and good practice sharing, which is, let's say, facilitated by the commission. Next slide, please. There are two initiatives of the commission, which are not uh, construction specific, they are, let's say, for all industrial ecosystems or areas, but construction sector was rather active in both of them. The first is the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, which was launched in 2013. And in 2015, construction sector made some effort to contribute to this initiative and presented about 50 pledges. So those pledges usually for, are made by construction companies which are having some apprentices and they are trying to, to contribute to improvement of the whole skills development at the European level and trying to contribute in some area of either supply, I mean, it's more apprentice or improving image of the construction sector or improving quality of, let's say, education and training provided to apprentices or improve mobility because the construction sector is a very much mobile industry. So construction workers are often, let's say, moving from one region to other or sometimes even across borders to other states. Based on this activity, uh, we commission, let's say, uh, commissioned the study, which was published in 2017, which mapped how it is really running, so providing some kind of insight about the vocational education and training in construction. The study is available at the link which is provided. And other initiatives, which was launched exactly a year ago, 
this Pact for Skills. And this is a partnership which uh, su supports creation of partnership between various in the particular area of uh, economy, so in particular sectoral in construction, to gather various companies to pool expertise and resources. Let's say, as, as I said, human capital is very scarce resource and it's rather not good way to, let's say, to waste it. So we should try to do our utmost effort, let's say, to use all capital, human capital available. So the next year, the Commission is preparing some kind of platform for this initiative, like one-stop shop, which will prepare various participants to creation partnership, to like set up certain uh, commitment, like they will contribute to improve skills, like providing more training annually to their workers and similar other initiatives. The initiative, as I said, just started a year ago, so I assume that in the coming months it will be bigger and bigger and provide more inspirational actions. Next slide, please. This is a new pol policy initiative which was just launched in the autumn. And as we have some environmental targets, uh, we, uh, we would like to enter into dialogue with our stakeholders to discuss how, the, from the policy perspective, we should achieve such a green and digital target, so some kind of green digital transition of construction ecosystem in this case, and also how to make the ecosystem more resilient, because as we see uh, the, by the current pandemic, it, it has some fragilities, and let's say we should increase its resilience. The process was just launched. We have some big meeting, gathering of construction stakeholders, this high-level construction forum in September. Then in October, we had the three meeting of clusters, which focused on green, digital, and resilience challenges of construction ecosystem. You would find at the link more information. Next slide, please. And I would like to add that the Commission is preparing a communication about this activity and also a survey then uh, let's say to get uh, some insight about from our stakeholders how to tackle this challenge and definitely all policy initiatives and uh, policy activities is rather difficult to do without appropriate data so they should our initiatives should be let's say based on data gathered and we lacked data regarding construction sector. So to have a really evidence-based policy in 2015, next slide, please. We launched uh, European Construction Sector Observatory. So observatory is gathering data, it analyzes them, interpret them and disseminate. Those data are comparable across the European Union so you can compare data across various countries. And the observatory uh, elaborates country fact sheets, so information about every European country, policy fact sheets. In this, uh, they are elaborated some interesting actions, either policy in initiatives or financial programs. And then uh, when uh, there is some interesting new trend, or we would like to get some analysis about some global area like energy efficiency uh, let's say constru uh, construction observatories providing either analytical or trend reports uh, two years ago a year and a half we elaborated analytical report on human capital human capital base uh, basis so let's say on skills and education in construction sector and it's available among analytical reports on the observatory page. Next slide, please. And definitely, I would like to inv invite you to consult the page of the observatory to get some insight about European construction sector. And that's everything from me. Thank you very much for your attention.
thank you so much for that uh, informative presentation. And I invite all of the uh, the attendees to please go ahead and answer, uh, ask any questions you have in the Q and A box. And with that, we'll move on to Maddie Salzman from the uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and she will give us her uh, perspective on on the uh, green buildings career map in the United States. So take it away, Maddie. Awesome, thank you so much. Can you hear and see me okay? I can, yes. Perfect. <laughs> okay, well, we can jump into the slides, but I'll just say thank you so much for inviting me to present on this panel. And um, I, will, I will try to move quickly, not just in the interest of time, so we have plenty of time for questions, but also, uh, because some of the great panelists that have already gone, I think, have, have brought up a lot of the same issues and um, topics that uh, that we're seeing, at least in the United States, from from a federal perspective. But um, my name is Maddie Salzman. I'm a management and programs analyst at the U.S. Department of Energy, where I split my time between the Building Technologies Office and the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, focused on how to support the workforce that uh, makes green buildings possible. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So uh, as I mentioned, about half my time is with the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, uh, which oversees about uh, 11 technology office areas, uh, all related to clean energy. And um, this administration in particular is very interested to figure out um, how can we ensure that uh, clean energy presents a really strong economic opportunity for folks around the country um, and that we have a sufficient uh, workforce in terms of size, skill, and compensation to carry out the clean energy transition that we're hoping to see. Um, so a lot of text on this slide, but just generally, um, we see this as fitting into our overall vision of, of achieving a uh, uh, net zero um, equitable transition towards um, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, at that, you know, that only happens if a workforce is ready to, to make it happen. Next slide. So, um, within the scope of the clean energy future, we all know that buildings are changing. Um, and, you know, there's a, a a lot of ways that we can think about this. One is that they're becoming more efficient, whether due to codes or retrofits um, or just more information and data as we know more about indoor air quality, more people are interested in improving their buildings. They're also becoming more technologically advanced with integrated comfort and fresh air systems, solar and vehicle charging, sensors, controls, cybersecurity systems, um, and also becoming more intelligent with that uh, technology advancement. So they be, are becoming more responsive to occupant needs um, to balance energy use costs and comfort. Um, and so this means that the uh, as as the role of buildings change, uh, we also need to think about the ways that that affects the role of people that construct and maintain those buildings, um, that they need new or different training and information to to do this uh, work effectively. Next slide. So, uh, starting with the basics, who is the building efficiency workforce? <laughs> who are we talking about? Um, and this is a, a really important point because I think there's certain areas that may, maybe people think of really quickly and then other ones that uh, maybe seem a little bit more disconnected, but we want to be thinking about all together. So, we think about the a pathway of efficient building technology from its development and research and manufacturing to design of buildings that connects uh, architects and engineers, connecting those technologies together to the deployment of those technologies, whether we think about construction and operations and maintenance and management. And then, of course, a diffusion category, which is a little bit of our catch all, but we want to think about people who manage services and programs, maybe have more of a business background. Um, maybe have a government background that help make um, the market pull of these technologies possible. And we know that there's already um, 2.3 million workers in the United States that are, are doing efficiency work already, um, which is great. Um, but when we look at this 
the scope and scale of what we need to accomplish, we, we probably need more. Uh, next slide. So really quick, I, I just want to briefly go over some of the research we've been working on to, to kind of articulate, oops, sorry, articulate the status of the US building efficiency workforce. So we can go to the next slide. So first off, um, uh, and I guess spoiler, these these will be a little bit um, on the negative side, but there's a lot of challenges that we need to address. <laughs> so the first is that um, one thing many of folks have brought up is that there's a low or negative perception that many young people um, not, are not necessarily interested or aware of opportunities in the space. Um, many folks have already discussed how women and black Americans in particular are very underrepresented in this workforce um, to a fairly extreme degree. Um, and overall, there's a lacking identity within the building efficiency workforce that most of the people who do this work actually consider themselves to be construction workers or manufacturing workers or in business services. Um, and so that just makes it harder to kind of uh, find people who self identify in the space and want to learn more about efficiency. It's kind of um, an underspoken about element of, of the work that people are doing out in the field. Next slide. So you can imagine, uh, you know, let's say we get over that uh, interest hurdle. We have some people that are interested to join this uh, uh, career pathway. Uh, what's the next issue they run into? Well, they're not sure where to go or what to do. <laughs> um, so we know that credentials in uh, uh, sustainability areas are often fragmented and not transparent. So it's challenging if you're trying to figure out what skills and training you need. Um, to to actually acquire those things to to get a job. Um, we also know that sustainability trainings are often elective rather than foundational. Um, the last speaker talked about how we want to create this as the new normal that, you know, it's not, oh, green buildings are something you maybe need to learn about later on, um, you know, once once in your career, but as something that's kind of standard practice. Um, and we see that this shows up in terms of more hiring more uh, hiring difficulties among efficiency employers that, you know, many employers are struggling to hire across the United States for a whole host of reasons and that the this is more pronounced for folks trying to hire for efficiency workers. Next slide. And so finally, you can imagine, okay, somebody is interested, they've navigated through the hoops and challenges of getting the skills they need. Uh, they're in the workforce, that's awesome. Uh, we still have challenges and that is lacking skills for quality installation, particularly for the newest um, technologies that are available. So there's limited adoption of digital tools to streamline processes, which um, can make it challenging to, to quickly see if there's issues and, and address those. Um, we also know that building science information is often ad hoc and not standardized, which means that um, you know, people can be teaching to slightly different ideas of what best practices actually look like. And we've been able to notice um, in the field that there are um, often maintenance and installation issues with many energy efficient technologies in the US um, that, that cause reduced performance and overall lack of trust in the technologies that are being deployed. Okay, next slide. <laughs> So finally, I do want to mention, you know, at a very high level, training does not make a workforce, um, demand does. So, uh, you know, a lot of the challenges that I just mentioned have to do with identifying best practices, making sure credentials are available, making sure, you know, we can all agree on what job tasks people need to be able to accomplish. Um, all of that is really great for having people with skills, which is super, super important and not something we need to ignore, but we can't do that separated from the eight things that make demand for those skills needed around the country. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole host of different types of um, activities that can help make sure that you are putting people to work with those skills and not just preparing them in theory <laughs> um, and kind of creating a market pull for, for the demand of skilled workers. Next slide. Okay, so that's a lot of issues <laughs> and I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what the building technologies office is doing on workforce development. Next slide. 
So uh, our goal is to ensure that there are career pathways for a diverse and qualified building efficiency workforce that enables high performance buildings nationwide. And if you kind of think about the pipeline of workers going from early career exposure and education, maybe they're still in secondary school, to people early in their career doing apprenticeships and on-the-job training, to people who are mid and late career. Um, we've identified each of those issues along the way from negative perception, confusing pathways, poor quality installation, and lacking market stability, and then are trying to identify um, task areas that help us address those barriers. So building interest in these careers, streamlining paths, improving skills, and supporting demand. Next slide. So uh, really quick, I wanted to highlight, you know, across these areas, uh, we have, uh, I manage about $15 million in awards that support the green buildings workforce. And you can kind of get a sense of what are the things we've funded in the space so far, um, primarily, uh, trying to develop and integrate resources that reach key audiences with information about green buildings. Um, so the first category is projects that are trying to reach high school students, college students, and generally new entrants to the green buildings career pathways. Um, we also have some resources that we're working on to reach architects, engineers, and architectural engineering students. Um, uh, third, uh, we have a, a few different projects that are going on to reach commercial building operators and facility managers. And then finally, we also um, have some uh, previously funded awards on building safety officials and trying to reach them with information, not just about efficiency products, but also um, solar batteries, uh, vehicle charging, et cetera, and, and reach uh, audiences that need to learn about multiple of, of these technologies all at once together. And I have highlighted here the Green Buildings Career Map, which is one of the resources that we have funded and that I'll talk about on the next couple slides. Uh, next slide. So the Green Buildings Career Map is kind of an overarching resource that we worked on with the Interstate Re uh, Renewable Energy Council that features over 50 careers across various sectors that support green buildings. Um, and so really trying to take that broad brush approach that there are folks that do construction and installation work in the field and there are people that have advanced professional degrees that all are kind of a part of this equation. Um, it's a web page available at greenbuildingscareermap.org um, that's interactive, featuring career pathways, salary information, and educational requirements. And this was part of our uh, advanced building construction initiative in the Building Technologies Office. Uh, next slide. So um, one thing that I mentioned, here's a different screenshot of the map where it shows advancement pathways. This one starts with an entry level career as an installation apprentice. Um, the whole map features 11 in demand entry level occupations across these sectors and each shows advancement potential within the green buildings industry. Um, a really important point I think also is that we've featured 32 what we call new collar positions that don't require a college degree ranging from entry to advanced level roles. Um, and I think, you know, this is probably a, a broader perspective, but um, we've done a really poor job of showing um, young people what a future in various careers can look like, especially if, you know, Going to college is great. We think that's a fantastic option for many people, but um, it's not always a requirement to to get a great job and so and and be on a career path. And so that's something we want to be emphasizing here. That um, you know whatever type of thing you're interested to do post high school, there can be a pathway for you here. Um, and then there's a lot of resources as well. So I provided a link to the uh, resources page um, that is navigable from there. And finally. Uh, Oh, we can go to the next slide. That's all good. Uh, finally, some useful links for more information on clean energy jobs. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't call out the first one where all of our funding opportunities get posted from um, the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. So, um, you know, if if you are interested in funding opportunities from uh, our offices, uh, that's where they will land on that first link. But there's a lot of other resources that relate not only to green buildings, but also uh, clean energy workforce resources from across uh, the US Department of Energy and, and looking to link these things more together. And I believe that's my last slide. So we can go to the next one. 
Fantastic. So th there's my email. I'm always happy to chat. Um, as we're figuring out, of course, there's, you know, the, the infrastructure bill uh, has recently become law. Um, so we have a lot of work on our plates to figure out uh, how we're uh, taking on more activities in this space. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Maddie. Um, with that, we'll move to, to Q&A for both panelists. And I believe the first question is for you, uh, Roman. Uh, do you think we can use procurement clauses to get more apprentices into companies and into our industry? And will the EU lead the way in the procurement directives? Well, I, I must say that I am not exactly a specialist in public procurement, but we spoke about football today, let's say already in the beginning. So let's say uh, I understand it well that the Gunde think, uh, thinks something like uh, for football clubs, that every football team to play in a in a league will need at least one player under 19 in he, he, uh, its team. Yeah, that this is this is interesting idea. But uh, maybe you know uh, then uh, there will be a rather big run for young players, and there will be rather much more expensive because everybody will need some of them. So I am not sure how it might work. In my work, might not. I don't know. Probably will, would necessarily be said it rather well that uh, that uh, it it works. Let's say, and there is no some kind of harms to activities of companies or or, or the market. So, but perhaps it's option. So definitely we are trying to expose various options that also member states are doing how to address the issue, of course, with cooperation with our trade unions and construction companies. All right, thank you. And for, for this one is for, for both of you, maybe we'll start with Maddie on this one. How do you measure the impacts of your work? And what is the process for gathering feedback from, from the industry or from other stakeholders? Great question. And it's really hard. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that, you know, I think there's some metrics that can be collected more immediately. Things like if you're running, if you're helping fund a training program, you know, how many people have you reached and um, have you successfully reached um, people in the target populations that you were trying to reach, you know, whether it's, it's high school students or getting a certain percentage of women participating, et cetera. Um, but all of those, you know, those metrics are good in the short term, but you often need longer term metrics to really have a better understanding of, okay, did that actually lead to a entry level career to a long term career um, and and help be able to drive that person's um, uh, role in this space forward. Um, and so we're trying to figure out actually some ways right now around how we can best account for that in the short term. Um, some of the things we're looking into, are there ways we can um, either measure or require or, or include um, partnerships between training organizations and employers where they can kind of set out a, a, a memorandum to a, a, agree to at least interview ideally higher people that are graduating from certain programs so um can we use that even though it is not like a full outcome of that person being hired yet to understand that we are driving the impact that we want to see i know in general um doe is always very interested to figure out how to make our programs durable um and so that can mean a lot of different things but i think for me it has to do with you know DOE can help inject money and there's moments where we get like the infrastructure bill and things that can be really great to, to get money out the door, but will it continue beyond that funding and how can we successfully um, fund projects that then industry or other partners are willing to take on after DOE funding ends? Roman, I'm curious for your ideas though. <laughs> Uh, if I would say uh, about the Commission, definitely when Commission is uh, willing to introduce some uh, bigger initiative, we will need to prepare some kind of inter impact assessment and elaborate scenarios. And uh, those are, let's say, a very thorough uh, uh, let's say elaboration of possible, let's say, ch challenges, how to overcome them, what is the best scenario, what is maybe not so good scenario. And 
those impact assessment is being scrutinized very toughly and uh, let's say and only when it passed our scrutiny board the let's say the initiative can be passed further to our legislators to be adopted and definitely when the initiative is adopted this impact assessment is being published so all public can follow our thinking also follow our figures and follow what we think about the final impact of the initiative so this is about some beginning or some legislation or some communication like the renovation we have stuff like that when we are doing some particular projects as was already uh, mentioned by uh, Madeleine, that, that we are using various uh, indicators so every project has some kind of indicators and there we are following whether those indicators have been fulfilled uh, what, which have been or exceeded which perhaps not fulfilled so well and trying to draw some lessons learned for next future projects. Uh, we also have a, uh, I think, a comment I, from Gunda to, to Maddie uh, about a program that, that you have called Boss Ladies, where young female apprentices promote education and trades towards girls in primary school um, and girls who have a high school degree, but who may not want to be in ac academics. Um, Gunda, is there a question that you wanted to ask? I also have to comment. I've been sitting here with my winter coat because, and I've been thinking this whole time you're speaking, I'm excited for more women to get into HVAC trades in the US because I'm perpetually cold no matter the season. So um, just just to, to say that. It, it was, if I may, it was actually a, a, an answer to Natalie who, who asked if we had programs and, and we have this boss lady program and, and, and it's, it's actually quite good. It's actually quite good and they're really tough young uh, boss ladies who can, uh, who can tell a good story about why uh, women should, uh, should join uh, construction. And, and also tell about that you can actually go on, be an engineer, be an art architect, start your own company etc cetera, etc cetera. it gives you a, a lot of opportunities so and i think that that story is very important to 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 tell but but in my part of the world and and in north america uh, <clears throat> construction is predominantly a male thing when we talk on on building sites women in construction are usually architects and they're very yep. brilliant many of them but but we would like more women for for for, for many good reasons because we are excluding ourselves from half of the labor market, which is like stupid by all means. Thank you. Yeah, I could not agree more. <laughs> I think there's a lot of great work to be done um, to kind of uh, connect the dots on the value of this work. Um, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I'd love to look more into the Boss Ladies program. I, I'm aware of one program that I know some folks have done um, I think it's called Rosie's Girls, uh, I think based on Rosie the Riveter, um, but it's like a plumbing and welding training, you know, early stage <laughs> plumbing and welding uh, in training program for, I think, like middle school girls where they get kind of access to, to some of that um, equipment. Um, I don't want to totally speak incorrectly about that program, though. So there's there's tons of really great programs that I think are existing in this space. I'm al also really interested to connect the dots. You know, I think um, climate and and having a big impact on the world is something that interests lots of people. And you know, I can speak personally from my experience. Like I did not become interested in this space because I just love technology for technology's sake. I became interested because I wanted to impact climate and I wanted to impact housing. Um, and then realize that technology was a way to do that. And I think sometimes they've found, um, you know, really connecting those stories of what is the overall goal, the impact of this work can really be, be meaningful to a larger pool of people. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists today, both for your presentations and also the important work that you and your organizations do to create career opportunities and build the workforce that will help us build better resilient buildings and renovate more buildings faster. Um, I'm also grateful for the community gathered here today from both the EU and the US. We've clearly got lots of work to do to build the workforce, so let's get to work. 
Um, I just want to remind you all um, that you will receive copies of the presentations in an email on Monday um, and that this uh, US EU series will continue uh, with the fifth and final webinar on building standards and codes to uh, tackle climate go goals, some of the, the policies that can get to the demand that Maddie is talking about need, being needed in order to, to get more jobs out there. That will be coming on um, Tuesday, the 11th of January, and, and that's 2022, not 20. We're not going backwards, we're only going forward. So uh, January 11th, 2022, we will see you back here on this webinar. Um, thank you again to the speakers and to the audience on behalf of BPIE, IMT, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the U.S. Department of Energy, the European Commission, and, uh, and all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.